In 3.3, we started that yesterday with the chain rule. It's a super long section. We're going to be in it for all of today, and we might still be in it uh, tomorrow. We've been learning rules for differentiation. We've said that the limit definition is not really viable sort of in day-to-day -day life. And we need a better way for taking derivatives. And we've given a few already. The main thing we've given is what I've called the power rule for taking the derivative of a power. And this includes roots because roots are powers. Like the square root is the one half power. And I, I guess sort of as a special case of this, but we don't normally think of it as a special case. It's normally just something we learn. The derivative of x is one. And then I said that the derivative of a constant times a function is the constant times the derivative, maybe I'll, maybe I'll mix uh, my notation here. It's the constant times the derivative of the function. So with these three rules, oh, and kind of trivial, but since I'm summarizing, I'll put it on the derivative of a constant function is zero. So for example, I mean, we did a bunch of examples yesterday. So I'm not going to heap the examples on, but five x squared. If we want to know how quickly this function is changing. We've got a constant times a function, first of all. We've got this five and we've got this x squared. And according to that rule I was just looking at, we can pull constants like five out of derivatives. Then the derivative of x squared is two x to the first. The two comes down and two minus one is one. Raising to the first power doesn't do anything. So we'd probably just write our answer as 10x. And now we want to expand on this. We want to answer in particular the following question. We know how to find the derivative of 5x squared. We did that right here. And we know how to find the derivative of x cubed, for example. We just hit it with 
the power rule. If we know how to find the derivative of 5x squared and we know how to find the derivative of x cubed, does that mean that we know how to find the derivative of their sum? Can we find the derivative of 5x squared plus x cubed? And the good news is that we can, and we do it in a very intuitive way. To find the derivative of the sum, we find this derivative, we find this derivative, and then we add the derivatives together. So probably if I'd, for, if I'd forced you to guess what this derivative is, it's um it's what you would have come up with and let me again we're mixing and matching our Lagrange and our Leibniz notation here the derivative of a sum is gotten just by taking the individual derivatives and adding them together. So let's take this and let's turn it into, into a problem. Let's find the derivative of 5x squared plus x cubed. So according to what I have written here, we just find the individual derivatives, which we've already done. They're 10x and they're 3x squared. And we take those derivatives and we add them together. So that's how we take the derivative of a sum, kind of no muss, no fuss. We wanted another example. Um, we now have the knowledge required to take the derivative of any polynomial. I guess I haven't explicitly addressed the question of subtraction, but subtraction works just the way that addition works. You find the individual derivatives and you subtract them. If we want a derivative like this, we just take these pieces one by one. We start with x cubed, the three comes down, and then three minus one is two. And we have subtraction here. So we'll subtract X squared. The two comes down. We normally don't bother writing first powers, but maybe just for clarity, two minus one is one. This power minus one, it's this power. And now we're no longer using the, um, the power rule, really. The derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of a constant is 0. So plus 1, plus 0. And again, you wouldn't ordinarily write first powers. 
you wouldn't ordinarily write plus zero. Neither of those things are doing anything. We just put them there for clarity. And we're pretty, we're pretty limited in our examples right now because there are so many derivatives we still don't know. We can't do anything involving trig functions or exponentials or products or quotients. So another quick example, it's still going to be a polynomial because these are practically the only things we know how to work with. If we want this derivative, we just take these individual terms and deal with them one by one. So, Obviously, you're learning new stuff. You've got to memorize the product. I mean, the um, power rule. I won't say it's straightforward exactly, but at least it's, I hope, intuitive. Um, for this 5x squared, the 5 stays put, and we take the derivative of the x squared. For this 2x, the 2 stays put, and we take the derivative of x. For this minus 1, minus 1 is just a constant. Um, so unlike this 5, which has an x squared attached to it, and this 2, which has an x to it, this minus 1 doesn't have anything attached to it. It's just minus one. And the derivative of a constant is zero. Simplifying our answer, what am I doing? Five times two, I've got this, that's 10x plus two. We should learn a more, uh, we should learn other rules now. Does anybody have any questions about addition or subtraction? Let me before, actually, I have something else I should probably say now before we get any further away. I want to make this, I want to make something explicit. It's going to make all our lives much easier if we understand this. And I keep, sorry about that. Keep just writing the wrong numbers and words. Power rule caveat. All I want to say, but I want to make this explicit, is that the power rule, as we have learned it, only works for x to the n. And I mean, yeah, you, you might be sort of thinking, Obviously, that's what we have written on the whiteboard here. But what I want to make explicit is that, for example, the derivative of the sine of x to the fifth, let's say, is absolutely 100% not 5 times the sine of x 
face to the full earth. We cannot use the power rule every time we see a power. We use the power rule in the very specific case where we have X raised to a power. Taking the derivative of this is going of the sine of X to the fifth requires some more heavy machinery. We'll get to it at some point, but it's not just a matter of hitting it with the power. And now we've done addition and subtraction. You might think that the next things to come will be multiplication and division, if only because I accidentally wrote the word product in the last frame. And you would be right. We want to learn how to take the derivative of a product. And here's where things get kind of weird. Let's, let's start with a very simple example. Well, Simple obviously is relative. I've been doing this for a long time. Simpler example, let's say. And what makes this simpler is that we're multiplying two things together, but one of those things is a constant. And we know how to take this derivative. The constant just stays put. The derivative of x is 1. And the derivative of 5x is 5. Now let's look at the 5 and let's look at the x individually. Five is a constant. Its derivative is zero. X has a derivative of one. So if we take the individual derivatives, the derivative of the five and the derivative of X, and we multiply them together, we clearly do not get the derivative. So the product rule cannot work like the sum rule does. If we take those derivatives and we multiply them together, we do not get the right answer. Let me even go so far as to write that explicitly into our notes. The derivative of f of x times g of x is not the derivative of f times the derivative of g. We saw this explicitly one frame ago. So what is the derivative of f times g? I I think it's fair to say that nobody would guess this if they haven't already seen a calculus. But let's say we have the function fg of x and we want to differentiate it. 
what we do. We leave the first function f of x alone. We differentiate the second function and we multiply those together. Then we leave the second function g of x alone. We differentiate the first function and we multiply those together. Finally, we combine those two products via addition. So on the face of it, this is a very unintuitive formula. Why does it, why does it work that way? Let's ask that question and our answer is going to be very informal. Let's first make the following observation. What is the derivative? I mean, it's a rate of change. It's a tangent line slope. But can we give a kind of more clear explanation? Well, this is, do we have any like business majors in here? No? So you won't have seen this idea before, but the derivative f prime of x is approximately how much f of x changes when x increases by one. And I underline approximately because this is not exactly true for some very sort of ugly functions, it might not be even a very good approximation. But like f prime of two is approximately the difference between f of three and f of two. Let's now try to take, and I asked if there were business majors in the room, because this sort of understanding of the derivative gets used a lot in business applications, like the marginal cost, the marginal revenue, and the marginal profit are all business sort of terms that are defined using this understanding of the derivative. Let's take this understanding of the derivative and let's try to un um, understand this rule in those terms. Let's imagine f of x and g of x as the sides of a rectangle. And f of x 
time is g of x is there for the area of this rectangle. And let's ask ourselves if we increase x by one. What happens? Well, according to our understanding, our very informal understanding of the derivative that's given on this frame, if we increase x by one, f of x will increase by f prime of x and g of x will increase by g prime of x. And we're now asking how much the area of the rectangle would change. Well, it increases by this amount, first of all. And this amount is f prime of x times g of x. And it increases by this amount second of all, and this is f of x, the side of a rectangle is f of x, times g prime of x. So, you see that both of the terms in this derivative are showing up in the graph. And that's basically where this formula comes from. You might be objecting that we're missing a piece of this new rectangle and our not very edifying answer is that Oh, I guess I didn't write it on the board. Ah, here I did. My not very edifying answer is that we're keeping this informal and part of that informality is not asking too many questions about what happens to this little square up here. It's we don't worry about it for a number of reasons that we're not going to go into. But here's kind of where this form to the comes from. This isn't a, this isn't a real analysis course, though. We're asking questions about where formulas come from isn't what we're here for. This is an applied count. I mean, it's we have a course explicitly called applied calculus. This obviously isn't that, but calculus is an applied area of mathematics. What we want to do is take derivatives and then do applications involving derivatives. So this kind of argument, I mean, I think it's nice to see if you don't have to memorize it or anything. What you do need to be able to do is use the product rule. And we're kind of suffering here from knowing so few derivatives. I 
think an argument could maybe be made that um, we should learn the derivatives of the trig functions first, for example, so that all of our examples wouldn't be these polynomials. But I'm following the textbook, and this is the order of the textbook does things in. And let's take the derivative. So addition is commutative. So it, I mean, I wrote things down in this order, but whether you take the derivative of f first and then the derivative of g, or whether you put these in a different order, whether you take the derivative of G first and then the derivative of F, doesn't matter. We've got a product. We need to take the derivative of one of these terms. Let's say the first term. And then we'll leave the second term alone and we'll multiply them. And now we'll take whichever derivative we didn't already take. So we'll take the derivative of this x cubed term. We're going to add these. We're also going to run out of space on this horizontal line. So let's go down here. We'll take the derivative of the x cubed polynomial, 3x squared minus 2. And we'll leave the other polynomial alone. And we have these two products and we add them together. The product rule, as you can see from this example, tends to give some pretty ugly question. Is that supposed to be x squared plus 2x plus 1? Or like the, the last? You are right. A very good. We're taking the derivative of this, the x cubed term that turned into 3x squared. We are, I said out loud that we're leaving this alone, but my hands had a mind of their own, I guess. We are leaving the quadratic alone. These uh, this rule, as we see, tends to give us some pretty ghastly looking answers. We would probably bite the bullet and simplify this if we were going to use this derivative in any kind of applied problem. Um, 2x to the fourth. Minus 4x four squared. I'm foiling here, or whatever you call foiling when you have more than two terms. But I'm taking this 2x and I'm multiplying it by each of these elements in turn. Now I'll repeat that with the two. I'll take this two and multiply by each of these elements in turn. <sighs> and then I'm of running out of space, but then we repeat 
that. I'll take this 3x squared and multiply it by everything over here. And I'll take this negative two and multiply it by everything over here. And this is a long way from being simplified because we have a bunch of terms in common. Like, let me. I'm not going to copy this all onto the next frame. Let's just get a little messy. Let's first stop these things from blending into each other. We have a 2x to the fourth and a 3x to the fourth. That's going to give us a 5x to the fourth. Do we have any cubic terms? The two x cubed, two x cubed. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. So when you're foiling both, so your second equation there and your f of x derivative or whatever, wouldn't you be foiling three x cubed or three x uh, to the second times x second, and then so that would give you three x to the fourth, but then wouldn't three x squared plus two x give you six x to the sec third? Yeah, that's what I got too. Is that cute? Yeah, you're right. Thanks. And then as well as three x squared. Yeah. yeah. Not for the cube. Jeez. Well, thanks for pointing that out. Now <laughs> Try to be more careful in the future. So let's see, how does this affect our answer <coughs> over here? We now have this uh, two x cubed, but also a six x cubed. So that's an eight x cubed. Negative four x squared minus two x squared is negative six x squared plus three x squared. So that should be negative three x squared. Three. Minus two is one. Plus minus four is negative three. Then two x minus four x minus another four x minus six x. And then two and negative two, our constants go away. <laughs> So I was going to say, and I certainly demonstrated this, that act just using the product rule is very straightforward. If you know how to take the component derivatives, it's more the simplification where errors occur where I see errors, and in this case, where I make them. Uh, what other examples could we do with the derivatives we know? It would be interesting maybe to check the product rule. Say we have something like 2x minus 1. times x plus three. 
and we wanted to take the derivative of this. Well, this is a product, so we can use the product rule, but what we could also do is we could say, well, this is a polynomial. And we know how to take the derivatives of polynomials using the power rule. So if we foiled this out, 2x squared plus 6x minus x, we can take the derivative of this. And then we can take the derivative of that using the product rule. And we can see if we're blowing smoke or if the product rule is really working. Um, let's take the derivative using the product rule. Okay. Keep those separate. The derivative of 2x minus 1 is 2. And this is, I mean, the homeworks due Saturday as usual, but this is, I mean, the sooner you get down things like the power rule, the better because we're seeing, we're just using them every day in our course now. Um, the derivative of 2x minus 1 is 2. We leave the x plus 3 alone. Now we'll leave the 2x minus 1 alone. And the derivative of x plus 3 is one. The derivative of x is one. The derivative of three is zero. One plus zero is one. Two x plus six plus two x, wait, Did I two x squared plus six x minus one is five x minus three? Derivative of two x minus one is two x plus three we leave alone. The derivative of x plus 3 is 1. 2x minus 1 we leave alone. Two x plus, oh no, I I sorry, I <laughs> everything was right, but I needed to be more confident. 2x plus 2x is 4x. 6 and minus 1 is 5. And if we now go over here and just use the power rules and the sum rules, 2 we leave alone because it's a constant. The derivative of x squared is 2x. 5 we leave alone because it's a constant. The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of negative 3 is 0. And we do end up with the same thing. The derivative of this is 4x plus 5. And that is what the product rule gave us. We should, the quotient rule is so awkward looking. 
we should give you a day to, to try to get used to the product rule before we hit you with the quotient rule. So I'm going to end this here. We are still in section.